Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is the Gargoyle Issue. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Today is the 14th of March, 2018. We have survived another nor'easter in Connecticut. Yay! Uh, so I'm surviving having the family home yesterday. The kids are home from school. The wife is home from work. And uh, my office becomes uh, just a uh, an exciting place of noise. I can't record shows. It's just not worth trying. Uh, the dog's all hyper. The cat's freaked out because there's people here. And today, because it's Connecticut, it just melted. Poof. Yeah, we went hmm. to 40 degrees and all that snow that dropped down uh, yesterday and caused misery is gone. Uh, you guys still having snow issues over there? I see people posting pictures all the time of snow in England. Oh, well, um, I live such a parochial life, Kevin, I didn't know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's right. in, the, in the hill opposite me, there have been little gullies of snow. And as I come out of... Uh, uh, I've just managed to start morning prayer again in my cathedral shed. Ah. And as I come out and look over the valley, I see the, the snow drifts um, slowly shrinking. So oh, good. We've, we're nearly completely free from here, just a few left. Uh, and then maybe that's the end of winter. It's been an exciting winter it's, in this yeah. part of England. <laughs> yeah, all Europe has suffered from snowfall. I was very surprised about that. I was watching uh, one of my favorite races, the, the Paris-Nice race, uh, bike race. And uh, they were dressed in real warm clothes the first couple of days, uh, as Europe is cold. Um, enough weather. I, you know, follow the blogs in the Anglican world, and I saw a, a picture of a stormtrooper on a cross. I said, obviously, yes. I'm going to have to talk to Gavin about that. But I can't complain because I used to be an Episcopalian, and we used to have the Darth Vader gargoyle on top of our national cathedral. So I can't really point fingers and say, nan, nana, boo, boo. Uh, you guys are all crazy over in England because we're crazy here, too. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Stormtrooper. Is it good theology, and <laughs> what's it doing on a cross? Well, the there may be a benign version of this story. The benign version, I suppose, would run something like this was an exhibition designed to raise money for uh, a campaign to find a missing person. And probably the vicar just said to the organizers, yes, you can use the church, because after all, what vicar likes to set himself up as the Inquisition sure. and no, to be a, a censor of things. However, whatever the story is, it ended up with the most grotesque well, I would say piece of blasphemy. Um, the fact is, Jesus on the cross touches Christians in the deepest possible way. And the idea that within a church, or even without a church, but especially within a church, you could have some kind of um, pejorative variation on that uh, is 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 really, it's frankly unbelievable. So this stormtrooper found his way into the, onto the cross, into the church. I'm pleased to say that the, the present reports are that enough local people complained and said, this is outrageous. So apparently they've moved it to somewhere else in the church. <laughs> <laughs> so the, they haven't actually taken it down or got rid of it. They just moved it, so it's a little less offensively conspicuous. Uh, but you you just have to you just have to ask whether or not um, the people involved in this story have any sense at all of what the faith means. Well, in the liberal world, the greatest art they can find is art that uh, denigrates Christianity. Uh, we had a, a famous. Uh, art argument here in the in the middle 80s and 90s about a crucifix in a jar of urine and mm. uh, that was art and our national art endowment was going to pay for it and fund the artist and um, that just went on and on and art was never designed to denigrate Christ Christianity or God's creation um, but it, it seems to well, here's the thing, Kevin. I think one of the things we may find ourselves doing in, in this is, is making some comparisons. Um, the fact is that if you were to say something that offended uh, a Muslim's understanding of Muhammad in a public place, uh, and for this, in this particular case, the church showing an exposition is a public place, uh, public censure would break over your head in in okay. in, in violent waves. Once again, there's a double standards with with Jesus and with Christians and with Christian sensibilities. So uh, in the end, all they've done is 
I mean, they, they they failed to understand by first of all creating this piece of art, and all they've done now is to move it. Um, and I I just I I still think though that that it's partly our fault. Um, I, I'm so aware that Christians spend time arguing over the crucifix. You hear you hear some some people from a Reformation background saying, well, you know, you shouldn't have a person on the cross in the first place, and then you hear some Catholics say, well, what, what on earth are you doing taking him off the cross? We 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 wrangle us uh, we wrangle between ourselves, and yet when it comes to these great matters and moments of a profound public offence, uh, the the level, the volume of, of outrage is is pretty mute amongst Christians. Mm-hmm. So I, I think we have to look to our to our own sense of offence. We 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 should be more concerned for the proper presentation of Jesus in the public space. I think than we appear to have been. Yes. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mute my phone. Let me do that real quick here. All right. I feel so. I feel so pompous. I've, the last thing I did was put mine on mute. But probably my iPad will go off now. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> I mean, for a Skype show, we're lucky that we don't get more Skype interruptions too. Ding, 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 oh, ding, we ding, are. ding. Absolutely. So, yes. um, going through my notes here, last week, uh, George and I in our show talked about the great stain in our church, you know, the, um, the sexual stain that's you know, been with us since day one. Um, and you guys have had an uh, independent commission talking about this for almost a week and a half now. And I saw that Wallace Ben was being interviewed. I didn't get a chance to look into it uh, and investigate what he said. I thought I'd catch up with you. Um, still talking about sexual s- uh, stain within the church. Uh, what are the latest uh, ramifications? It's really been a fascinating experience to follow this inquiry. The the lawyers conducting it are are really very good. Um, I've been I've I've been less impressed by the questions asked by the tribunal. There's four four judges uh, effectively sitting in on it: um, a professor of history, a, a previous lawyer, uh, a, a woman professor of social work, and um, and one other. But but seeing the diocese that I was part of examined in minute detail has been an extraordinary experience. Um, I think the thing that surprised me most with the interview with Wallace Ben was mm-hmm. uh, Wallace got very angry about something called the Meakin Report, which was a report that he said if, if, if it had been published, he would have sued because it contained a number of inaccuracies. And behind the Meakin Report were a series of really quite bad relationships, personality clashes, people who got cross with each other, um, the, the the diocesan staff meeting clearly wasn't functioning as you might hope it to. I, I have to say, I know perfectly well. Uh, from, from, <laughs> I have uh, heard a thousand uh, stories just like these. <laughs> <laughs> you go to almost any diocese on the planet Earth, and just short uh, of chaos, you know. Absolutely, that's right. So it's a bit hard on Chichester to be examined microcosmically uh, like, like this. Um, the thing that surprised me was that, that Wallace Ben gave an account of himself. Uh, it was slightly flawed by a couple of lapses of memory uh, and, and, a, and a, a couple of lapses in paperwork, but on the other hand, not to an abnormal level. Um, and he explained in particular, I, I, th- I think one of the real issues was, had he tried to hide a, a clergyman from being reported? And, and he explained how the whole thing happened. Essentially, it happened in two parts. Somebody who was very well known in the diocese had a historic court martial. Uh, and knowing what we know now, of course, all alarm bells would ring. But this was a slightly different age. And Wallace foolishly asked whether or not this ancient historic uh, matter needed the full glare of publicity. Uh, Then another piece of information came in suggesting that the historic problems were current and immediately all the communications cords were pulled, Uh, he was delivered into the hands of of the police and so on. But despite Wallace explaining this, the very next day in a newspaper, uh, Wallace was pilloried for uh, trying to hide a clergyman from justice. And I realized it, it, it almost makes no difference what you say. The the impetus for scapegoating, the capacity for misinformation, and almost the gravitational pull tearing this kind of convoy downhill without sufficient brakes means that um, the, 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 the 
it, it's very hard for people to pay attention to things they don't want to hear. I think in the end, P Paul Wallace got a chance to make his case and those with ears to hear would have heard that he behaved honourably and competently most of the time. Well, uh, or people probably say all the time. Um, and that the, the lapses were lapses in process, uh, miscommunications, uh, a, a, a dysfunctional diocese, a, a speedy change in terms of what was expected of who and it not being clear who was taking responsibility. And this perpetual conflict between, uh, if you like, the professionals who did mm -hmm. child safety and the bishops who did clergy pastoral uh, oversight. But one of the things that's becoming clear is that the lawyers are saying, look to the church, uh, you're not very good at this, are you? You need professional oversight. And mm, I think by the yeah. end of the inquiry, we're, we're going to find the state saying uh, child sexual abuse is so important, we can't trust you to do it anymore. We will do it for you or we'll monitor the doing of it for you. Now, in one sense, nobody can complain that the very highest levels of monitoring should take place. But but we're back to Henry II and Beckett. The fear is going to be that the church will will seek to license the church. And if the church for any reason fails any of the criteria of an overscrupulous state, uh, then the state control of the church will, will develop too far. Now, well, this we then, we then set this in a context that I think you're going to raise. Yeah, well, your state is as flawed as the church, if not more so, because of your political correctness. Uh, I saw a breaking story about sex trafficking running rampant in a town in England, um, and everybody knew about it. The police, the protectors of your society, knew about it. It's documented they knew about it for 30... I didn't want to use a profanity, I'm not for 30 long years. At least 1,000 sexual victims under the age of 18. Uh, and these are the people who will be set to monitor the church. Uh, society in England, around the world, is more broken than the church. It's double standards. You're, yeah. you're quite right. The state is going to, I think, apply the very highest standards to the church, and it may find that it uses its power in a way that damages the church at, at times. The state is not using the very highest standards when it comes to the immigrant communities or to the Islamic community, uh, and it is simply backing off in a most lamentable way. Uh, you know, one of the things that a number of people say is, why should why should our daughters be sacrificed? To political correctness but but that's what's happening and in fact this town is only 15 minutes from me it's Telford so there have been other towns where Rotherham is the one that's been in the public domain but in this last 10 days um, my my local big town Telford turns out as you say to have had over a thousand abused girl as well actually I'm not sure it's true that everybody knew people on the ground may have known but mm. it was kept out of the public eye again um, if you compare uh, the desire to bring the Diocese of Chichester and the Church of England into the public eye for this level of scrutiny with the lack of scrutiny for a thousand underage girls uh, in a market town, then you indeed you don't... Um, oh, my iPad. <laughs> the Lord said Kevin needs some reparation. <laughs> I'm off the hook. <laughs> well, when I say everyone knew, I mean everybody who should have known, known, knew. Um, yes. Same same within the church. When I say everybody knew in the church, it means everybody who should have known knew. And I do see this absolute uh, hypocrisy in how uh, Europe is treating uh, uh, the Muslim immigration. Um, it's something that we need to get a, you know control of and very quickly um, we're moving on here in time i wanted to talk about uh, stephen hawking's real quick uh he passed on yesterday uh very famous theorist uh, in uh his field uh, he was not an experimental scientist uh but he, he genius uh, and i've read many of his books i understood his books because he took time to write at my level which is like your know, third grade um, and, uh, you know, I have much respect for his work and his theories, uh, um, especially stuff he took on from Einstein and others. Um, however, he 
uh, was an atheist. He did not believe in God. He did not believe anything he found in his studies pointed to God. Um, another man I respect very much is the uh, gentleman who discovered uh, DNA, the, the double helix. Um, he's an experimental scientist, and everything he found pointed to God. Uh, just as smart as uh, uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, I'll post a link to his stuff here. Um, and my problem here is we're using what the Greeks did, knowledge, uh, in order to expose or make relevant God. And that doesn't work, does it? No, it doesn't. I'm, I'm glad you understood the brief history of time. I have to say, it um, it certainly exposed to me my my incapacity for I physics. Look. I think someone someone has said that it's the the, 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 the best bought and least understood book of all time. I Although that. I think that also yeah. applies to the Bible, frankly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A lot of people who who have it don't understand it or don't read it. Um, I, I won't. I won't try and. I did a bit of genning up on on black holes and, mm -hmm. and event horizons for the program, but nobody needs to hear me pretending to understand physics when I don't. The thing I think that struck me most of all was when when um, when Hawking used the phrase, "If if here are some questions, and if we know the answers to them, we would understand the mind of God." He was, of course, talking about a different kind of God, mm -hmm. as you quite rightly say. Uh, he was talking more about uh, the God of, of rationality and, and intellect. Um, and I was, I was particularly struck with the contrast between him and Blaise Pascal. Uh, Blaise Pascal was one of our most uh, intelligent mathematicians. And one night, Blaise Pascal had an experience of God. And I think when it comes to our, our population also imagine that if the cleverest people don't believe in God, Perhaps that means God doesn't exist. Right. In fact, some of the cleverest do, but you have to have revelation. As Jesus says in the Gospels, you have to have the Holy Spirit to allow you to see. This is, in case people haven't read it, uh, Blaise Pascal, after uh, an evening of an experience of the Holy Spirit, wrote it down on a piece of paper and he, he sewed it into his coat so that the record of it went, went everywhere. And here's just 10 lines from Pascal's experience. Fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and of the learned. Certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace. God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God. Your God will be my God. Forgetfulness of the world and of everything except God. He is only found by the ways taught in the gospel. Grandeur of the human soul. Righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. Joy, joy, joy tears of joy i have departed from him they have forsaken me the fount of living water my god will you leave me let me not be separated from him forever this is eternal life to know you the one true god and the one you have sent jesus christ now he continues that it's the most beautiful love poem of revelation but but the for but but for, for stephen hawking there was no revelation, there was no Holy Spirit. In a way, one of the things that shocked me most as I read up about him was to discover that he turned to Wagner in his early years. Now, you see, I, I think, I have this theory that actually music can be holy music or unholy music, and I think Wagner's music is very unholy. Um, there are and some exposure. marches he has that are pretty <laughs> dark and dreary. Expo <laughs> exposure to Wagner is actually injurious to the soul. Mm. So what we have here is a very, very clever man, a man gifted with an acrobatic intelligence uh, who was unable to come to God, not because he was neither clever nor, nor unclever, but because uh, whatever intimations the Holy Spirit gave, gave him were were not accepted or, or not experienced and and our age has to learn yet again that intelligence is not the gateway to revelation the holy spirit is it is interesting yeah you brought up math here math proves god Math, you know you can mathematically put out an equation that proves the existence um of god science cannot disprove god uh, it just it can't it's tried for many years it's you know there's been a field of study to that science theory science theory can disprove anything it can disprove science um, but Hawking's you know was careful he just couldn't make connections that 
uh, other very intelligent people make. And uh, I, I just, I just have to say, I, I, I think I understand what you're saying, but I don't think math proves God. I think what math does is it, it proves the universe is coherent. Coherent. Um, it, 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 to my mind, it makes it almost inevitable that there is a mind behind the universe that sure. has re coded it in 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 principle, which is why I think it's so silly to be an atheist because they have the silly contradiction that that I you know I refuse to believe there's there's coherence, but the very fact that I refuse to believe it is a coherent thing. So, um, and as you say, science is all about falsification. Mm -hmm. In the end, I think science and maths take us very close to the possibility of God. But in the end, it's the disposition of the human heart that allows an encounter with God or refuses it, because this is uh, the, the this is the root of 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 um, of, uh, of freedom, the freedom and freedom of will to 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 hunger for God, and so to meet Him, because He responds to hunger or to refuse to hunger for him because he might displace our egos from being the center of the universe. My uh, <clears throat> college roommate was a uh, doctor, going to get his doctorate in math, and uh, we had that discussion one time, and he mathematically proved to me that God existed. Um, but I will actually back up my statement and say, math does not disprove God. Science cannot disprove God. Mm, um, mm. Science the theory, can, which was Stephen Hawking's specialty, uh, could disprove or prove anything. Um, but, you know, just like so many people before, I'm a great uh, man with a great mind. Um, uh, pray for him after death. You know, that's, mm. that's, that's what, what I do. Once again, Gavin, awesome show. We brought our audience to places they never thought they would go. Who knew there was a gargoyle of Darth Vader on the National Cathedral in Washington, <laughs> D.C.? I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 379 of Anglican Unscripted.